I, the speakers we've had have just been tremendous, and I have to hand it to the River District. Um, the Emerald Mile was really interesting. I remember when I was starting out my uh, engineering career, I worked for the uh, Bureau of Reclamation in Denver in 1983. I was an intern and saw the uh, uh, troubles that we're going through to try to manage uh, the spillways at Glen Canyon Dam and this whole idea of cavitation and what it meant. And it, I think it kind of steered me away from designing dams and more into the operation and maintenance of, of water facilities. But um, so, yeah, I want to talk to you about the uh, Colorado River Conservation Agreement. Um, and I really appreciate the opportunity here uh, to talk to you about that. I want to leave some time at the end um, so that uh, not only can hear um, and try to answer questions, but just be here to listen to your concerns about what's going on with that project. Um, I'll give a little plug for Denver Water right now before I forget. So um, I'm going to be speaking on behalf of Denver Water, but there's a lot of other folks that are partnering with us, and I'm not trying to speak on their behalf. Um, Denver Water is the oldest and largest uh, municipal provider in the state, uh, serve a quarter of the state's population. Uh, that's half of the metropolitan area, that's about 1.3 million people. Uh, we use about 2% of the water used in the state um, to do that, and our, ha about half our supply comes from the Colorado River. So I need to figure out how to flip the slides. <laughs> okay, I don't have a lot of slides, so. Um, so what I want to go over is the uh, what's the problem and and uh, what are we trying to do to address it? What are the solutions? Uh, how does our system conservation program fit in with that? Um, and I will refer you to the great uh, FAQ that Eric Kuhn put together. Um, covers a lot of that. I'm just going to um, hit hit the high points. Um, so let's go on to the next slide. Okay, so. Um, I think we're all somewhat familiar with what the problem is. 14-year um, drought, uh, it's the worst drought on, in recorded history, maybe one of the worst in the last 1,200 years according to tree ring data. Um, and uh, in a way, I think the, the river systems handled itself remarkably well to, to say that, that we're, we're still functioning quite well after um, a, a historic drought, but um, this is a look at uh, lake levels in Powell. Um, the concern is, and others have alluded to this, is we're, we're only a couple dry years away from Powell dropping down to the level that will lose hydropower output. Um, and that, that's, a real, um, that's a real problem um, that we all try to, that we all want to try to avoid. Um, there's uh, some mo recent modeling that's been done by the Bureau of Reclamation that suggests that um, over the next four years or so, we'll have about a, a five to 10% chance of hitting that level, and that, and that level grows over time to uh, maybe 10 or 20% chance of hitting that level uh, in the next 10 years or, or so. Um, so let's hit the next slide. Uh, this is a look at where the two reservoirs are. I think we've uh, seen some of this already. The, uh, the magic number at Powell is uh, an elevation of 3490 feet, um, and that would be about uh, 5 million acre feet uh, in storage, if I remember right. And then the Lake, the lake Mead, um, I think Brad Udall referred to that at about 1,000 acre feet. Um, Las Vegas really starts to uh, run out of water. Next slide. Um, so let's talk about the um, potential solutions. Um, what we're doing with our program is to try to put help to find one tool in a big toolbox of drought contingency measures that the four upper basin states are working on um, and have been working on for quite a while now. Um, and um, Let's see, I think I missed a slide here. Hold on just a second. Um, they've been working on it quite a while, and, and there's some big components to this, and you can read a lot more about it in, in Eric's piece, but 
There's the reoperation of the federal reservoirs where more water can be brought down into Powell at critically low periods to maintain the levels. There's the um, uh, cloud seeding and tamarisk removal is all part of a pr an augmentation program. And then there's the demand management, uh, all kinds of demand management efforts going on um, and being looked at. There's a lot of modeling to see what we could do. What we're trying to do is fit in a, a, small, uh, a, a small study that would um, last over the next two years um, to pilot ways in which we could um, quickly um, do some on the ground demonstration of ways to get more water in Lake Powell should we need to do that, should, the, should we not break out of this drought and the um, reservoir continue to decline. Um, and Eric, Eric does a nice job of talking about some of the big implications of what happens if we lose hydropower. Um, you know, there's hundreds of thousands of customers, I think, that get uh, their power from that uh, facility and uh, certainly helps keep their power rates down. The hydropower uh, is a big part of a repayment program on federal projects, helps fund the salinity control program, and of course the endangered species program, which for many of us uh, makes sure that our water systems are in compliance uh, with federal regulations. Um, to the extent that Powell drops lower and we lose the functionality of, power, of Powell, then we can't comply with our compact obligations anymore, and then we're at risk of this compact curtailment or a compact call. Um, and many have written on this subject, called it a, a potential chaos, a real dire situation. It doesn't take a lot of imagination to um, really uh, dream up some pretty terrible situations that could happen if we go into this sort of unmanaged problem. Um, uh, for, for Denver water, um, we are particularly concerned. We get half our supply from the Colorado River, and nearly all that is our underwater rights that are junior to the compact. So we're, we're subject to losing half our supply and all of our reusable supplies. Um, and our ability in the future to uh, develop more of those reusable supplies and meet those uh, future demands through reuse are really sort of all at risk uh, in this uh, threat of compact curtailment. Um, even um, there, and you can imagine all kinds of recreational environmental problems that could be created. Uh, you don't have to look too far just beyond Denver water system for an example. Think of what might happen in Summit County uh, if Dillon Reservoir is drained. Um, it could have a very uh, difficult impact on tourism in Summit County, um, probably on top of the, the surrounding ski areas really struggling to maintain uh, their snowmaking and their water systems. Um, and there's much bigger implications as well. And we all ter heard about what might happen to agriculture, this, this um, frenzy of uh, concern might lead to classic buy and dry of agriculture as sort of uh, a knee-jerk reaction to the crisis. Um, and there's the concern that the federal government's gonna step in and take over. And we've heard from uh, the Secretary of Interior um, that they are prepared to do that should we get in a very uh, dire situation. So it's clear to us that um, uh, not only does Denver Water have a lot at stake, but we really think the whole uh, upper basin and the whole basin itself has a lot at stake. And that's why we're feeling a sense of urgency about getting some of these on the ground uh, tests going to see what we can do should, we, should the dr this drought continue. Um, so let me tell you a little bit more about um, the program. Um, so we're looking at ways, like I said, to really get a fairly immediate reduction in water use and in a way that shows up in the river and makes it to Powell. Um, we want to look across all water use sectors. So municipal, industrial, 
and agriculture. We're not just targeting agriculture. Uh, we're not just interested in looking at, at, at following of agriculture. We want to look at the whole broad range of opportunities. And we want to get a diverse set of pilot programs to, to test. This will be a, um, a voluntary compensated um, set of emergency measures. Uh, the amount of money available is $2.75 million to be spent in the upper basin. Uh, like I said, over two years. Uh, it will be, it, we hope it will be administered by the Upper Colorado River Compact Commission as a four states program. We want to look at what can be done across the four upper basin states um, over two years. And there's a companion program that's being done in the lower basin. Um, they're off to a, a much faster start than we are. Um, they have available $8.75 million. Uh, that program is going to be run through the Bureau of Reclamation. Uh, the funding for, for both of these projects comes from four municipal providers, uh, Denver Water, along with Southern Nevada Water Authority um, serving Las Vegas and then the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California, plus the Central Arizona um, serving Phoenix and Tucson area. Um, and so uh, what I want to show you is some of the criteria that we'll be starting with to um, uh, look at pilot programs. Uh, let's go one more slide there. Okay, so these are the criteria, uh, sort of our starting set of criteria that we'll be looking at. So we want this diversity of pilot programs geographic diversity. As I said, we want to look across all water use sectors. We really want to test and, and demonstrate the ability to raise water levels in Lake Powell um, in an emergency short-term basis. Of course, uh, cost uh, effectiveness is going to be a consideration. The time to implement in emergency, we want something that can be done fairly quickly uh, and something that has a relative ease in the amount of administration and our ability to verify results. Um, and then we want to try to um, find projects that have uh, low potential for third party impacts and to look at how we might uh, mitigate those. Um, and then we also want to see if we can find areas where there are not a lot of downstream users that would divert any of the saved water and keep it from getting to Powell. Um, and, and therefore lessen the uh, difficulty we would have in, in um, obtaining forbearance agreements, which are agreements not to divert so that the water could be left in the river. And of course, we want to also look at ways that uh, would minimize any impact to the to recreation environment, and in fact, maybe look for some opportunities to uh, help the help the environment through some of these programs. Um, but like I said, we're going to be adding to these criteria. We have a uh, uh, a really good partnership started to help advise us on this program. If we could go to the next slide, Dave. Uh, uh, you can see them listed up, up there who are helping. Um, they all, all these partners uh, across the environmental and, and uh, uh, agricultural interests, they all have different reasons for partnering with on, us on this. They all have different ideas about how this program should be run. But I think we all really share a common concern about the uh, potential emergency situation we've got here and the need to really be proactive and, the, and, uh, and work together uh, being the best way really to get through this. So as you can see that, that press release is, is called an unlikely, par uh, unlikely partnership, um, but we think it's working quite well. A um, couple things I want to emphasize that, that the the system conservation agreement is not, because we've, we've heard some concerns about this, is we're not looking at a long-term program. Now, there are other parts of um, the drought contingency that do that. This is just short-term emergency measures uh, to save water. 
and we're not targeting ag or ag fouling. We want to look across all sectors, uh, municipal, industrial, irrigation, uh, east and west when, we, when I say all sectors. Um, I mean, next slide, Dave. Um, so I want to get into a couple of the uh, major questions that I've been asked about and try to address those and then leave a little time for discussion. Um, so why can't we just handle this problem with PAL through um, municipal conservation and, and restrictions? And that, that, that's a good question. Um, and uh, when we talk about conservation, we don't have quite the same definition <laughs> that one of the earlier speaker does, but we are, we are quite proud of what we do at Denver Water. If you look at over the history of our program, we spent about $100 million to date. Um, and we think we've saved about a million acre feet over the last couple decades. Um, and uh, about half of that is, was saved on the Colorado River, so about a half a million acre feet. And due to our junior water rights, I would expect that a good portion of that has ended up in, in Lake Powell already. Um, but we have a lot longer, we have a lot farther to go on our conservation program, like all municipal water providers, and we will continue to uh, push in that area as much as we can. The other tool we have in our toolbox are restrictions. And in, during this 14 year drought, we've gone on uh, lawn watering restrictions three times. Uh, our cost customers have responded very well. We know that when we ask them, they will cut back their water use by about 20%, uh, which gives us a very effective tool that we certainly plan to, on for uh, emergency operations. But to put the whole municipal water use in perspective, I think it's good to think about a few numbers and how much we're working with here. Um, if you look at some of the uh, SWAZI information, it suggests that uh, municipal use is about 8% of the total use. Uh, we heard about half of that is outdoor. So we have, if you're looking at the irrigation part of municipal use, it's probably about 4% of the total state's water use. If you look at what's exported from the Colorado River Basin for municipal use to the, in the Front Range, um, it's probably about 10% of the total, and then, a, and then of that, would be 5% uh, goes to uh, outdoor irrigation. So it's an important piece of the puzzle, but um, there's an, uh, it's just one, one slice of the whole pie. Um, I've been asked about, well, why, why, uh, why not just continue to work through the water bank? Uh, the Colorado Water Bank and Denver Water's been part of that. We are continuing to work through that. Uh, with the Front Range Water Council. Um, and we think that uh, water bank is in a very good position to help put together some proposals under this conservation program. Uh, we really look forward to that. Um, but we also have um, a desire to, to do more than is within the scope of work of the, of the water bank for the next couple of years. And we really think that this idea of testing uh, ways to quickly reduce water use in emergency should needs to be looked at across all four states and not not just within Colorado. Um, there's, uh, I'm sure, a myriad of other questions and potential challenges. Um, I know that Mark Harris, who I got a chance to see his slides, he's going to uh, bring up a lot of those. Um, we agree that uh, those are the kind of things that present challenges. We certainly look forward to partnering with folks and trying to be creative in how we can address those. Um, one of the things that we're trying to do right now is find some funding for more technical analysis and economic analysis for folks that want to put together proposals to help them work through the different management and uh, technical issues that might arise. Um, so I've been asked, why would an irrigator want to participate? Uh, there's certainly the, the citizen of the basin uh, consideration that we're all in this together. Um, it's certainly a way to be proactive, I think, and help, 
help protect ag from sort of this chaos, buy and dry uh, that may occur. But really the bottom line is it just has to make good business sense for agriculture. There has to be enough money in it uh, that it that it makes it better off and worthwhile for an, uh, an, an irrigator to participate. Um, if you're interested, how might you get involved? Uh, I think the, a good place to start would be with the Colorado Water Bank. There's several folks here who are part of that. I would encourage you to talk to them. I would also encourage you to talk to the partners that are working with us on this. I'll be glad to take your name uh, and put you on a mailing list. Um, and, uh, uh, and to the extent that you have certain technical or economic questions that you're interested in, uh, I would certainly be glad to, I would like to hear about those and, and uh, help think through how we might be able to address those. So in conclusion, um, we think the, the risks of, even though they're fairly low, this 5 to 10 percent of Powell uh, running out of hydropower is fairly low, uh, the consequences are just too, too dire to ignore. And we all have something in stake in working out um, something that gives security for the whole basin. Um, we're not, this isn't an, an agricultural issue, this isn't a municipal issue, it's a state issue and it's a whole upper basin issue. Uh, and if there's, there's one thing that, that I think Denver Water has learned from our um, negotiation, successful negotiations on the Colorado River Cooperative Agreement is that we all have to have our needs met. We all have to um, work together and we all have to come out winners. And that's the only way that we as a basin are gonna get through some of these very challenging issues. But we have some very promising, I think, tools that we need to explore. Um, and we're trying to do that in a way that's a, a test to gather information, um, intelligence, if you will, in a really collaborative uh, and proactive approach that can then be fed into the four basin states effort to help build us a, a drought contingency plan for the Colorado River. So those are my comments and I would be glad to hear any questions or concerns folks might have. Okay, I'm going to wait a minute because I know I'm not going to get away this easy without some hard questions. Yeah. My question is, my question is so how close are we to having this money being spent? Yeah, so we want to start spending the money uh, next spring, 2015. Sp spend it in 2015 and 2016 on uh, programs that uh, would reduce consumptive use and put water in, uh, back in the river. And that's the, that's the 2.75 million. Have you established the uh, initial price? Where am I looking? Who's? Okay, great. Okay, thanks. Uh, have, I, have we established the initial Price per acre. No, and so so um, uh, we'll 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 accept proposals, and people uh, I think need to figure out what's the right price for them, and make a proposal to us, and then we're going to consider all those factors that I that I mentioned, um, including price. There's there's there there have been some estimates that we're we're talking about. Uh, um, a price in maybe the range of a uh, hundred to two hundred dollars an acre foot, or some of the numbers that get kicked around. Um, we've also heard estimates of maybe a total of about ten thousand acre feet or twenty thousand acre feet that then might be available under this program. Um, if you spread that across. Uh, all these different water sectors uh, across four states. It means that we don't have an awful lot of 
money, um, and we're gonna, these pilots are gonna be relatively small cases, but we still think the demonstration will, and what we learn from them will be very important. Are you in for a harder one? <laughs> sure. Um, you, you mentioned the uh, municipal use being a pretty small percentage, I put it in the context of the whole state water use. Can you put that in the context of the Colorado River? In other words, um, Denver water supply, half that comes from the Colorado River, what does that represent vis-a-vis this side of the whole So, in the state of Colorado or the whole river basin? The river basin, the municipal okay. usage, you were talking about two yeah. I, th I think the, I don't, I don't know. I think it's, it's the percentage of municipal in the Colorado basin is higher than, say, in the state. So it's, so it, ag being about 85% in the state of Colorado is a bit lower in the whole basin, but I don't know. I'm sure somebody here knows better than I. Yeah. Mark. Uh, there we go. Um, as I understand it, the, the 2.75 million that gets spent in the upper basin, uh, th that amount has to be, or any project has to be approved by all of the uh, system conservation partners, including. Southern, uh, the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California, Southern Nevada Water Authority, Central Arizona Project. Um, do you think that there is a risk that this system conservation agreement opens the door to lower basin money coming into the upper basin uh, in the future and bring them in a process that's uh, uh, not combined with this system conservation agreement? Um, well, I think we were we tried to be very careful to keep the control within the upper basin and i maybe i didn't mention it well enough but um, and I, I i forgot to mention that any project that's done in a state has to be approved by the governor's representative to begin with and then uh, the upper colorado river commission is set to be the one to administer these programs um, but it is true that the, these four municipal partners plus the Bureau of Reclamation are the ones that are going to be um, deciding which of the pro pilots get funded. Um, and, um, I, and that will be uh, a case of looking to see that they're consistent with those criteria that I mentioned uh, with the idea that uh, we want to make sure we're getting as much of our money's worth as we can to test these these pilot programs, and that that that's really the interest. And so there'll be a companion sort of process that goes on in the um, lower basin as well. Uh, Mark, one of those criteria uh, that you shared with us was uh, easy to administrate, which suggests you. Your group may be looking at uh, large water delivery systems, large water entities, such as what we have here in the Grand Valley. Uh, however, Grand Valley irrigation water um, is very productive in terms of agricultural production, uh, very beneficial to uh, the entire state and to our communities, and therefore uh, would be some of the most valuable or high-priced water. Also, two of the three largest water entities here in the Grand Valley are federal projects, and the water is tied to the land by federal legislation and not available for transfer. Uh, so could you please respond to those considerations? Um, sure, and uh, this is completely voluntary. If a, if a large water district doesn't want to participate, certainly to, don't have to. Um, uh, and I'm not, I'm not an expert on tied to the federal land issue. I've certainly heard that. I think that's uh, something that uh, uh, needs to be explored more. We're not, in a sense, we're not asking to transfer water like we would in a water court case. Um, we're asking f uh, to look at ways to save water and just keep it in the river. 
uh, for a short term period. To the extent that um, Grand Valley irrigation is um, uh, producing crops that uh, are higher value than other areas, you know, maybe it just doesn't make e it would not make economic sense for an irrigator to participate and certainly realize that that potential. Thank you, Mark. I'm gonna